So, okay, uh, let me introduce you, uh, Daniela Calcetti. It's a pleasure for me to, to suggest uh, her name because Daniela is one of those astronomers that have a got a, her name in, in an empirical uh, astronomical uh, law. So there is this extinction law for external galaxies uh, called the, the Calcetti uh, law. Uh, Daniela made her, uh, her studies in Rome, the University of Rome. Uh, she finished uh, her PhD uh, thesis in 1992, something like that. And then uh, she moved to, to Baltimore to the Space Telescope Science Institute uh, and worked there first as a postdoc and then as a, as a researcher. In 2007, she moved to, to a faculty position in the Amherst, uh, in the University of Massachusetts in, in Amherst. And then uh, since 2018, she's been head of the uh, department, department of Astronomy. Uh, she also has a couple of awards, uh, one from the University of Groningen in the Netherlands, and the other one uh, by the Swedish Research Con Council. Uh, so she has spent also some time in the University of Stockholm. Uh, and finally, last year, she got elected to the National Academy of Sciences of the United States. So uh, Daniela worked on a galactic star formation. Most of us here in, a, sorry, on extragalactic star formation. Most of us here uh, in Morelia work on smaller scales on, on, on galactic star formation. So I thought it could be interesting to, to hear also from this other perspective, uh, from, from larger scales uh, about these topics. So I think uh, actually Daniela is going to talk somehow about the, the Calcetis uh, extinction law. Uh, so welcome Daniela, thank you for, for, for being here. Thank you for your kind introduction, Xavier. Thank you very much, everyone, for your invitation. So I hate when it's called the Calcetti law. Can we call it something else? <laughs> so uh, I will be revisiting some of uh, the many uh, attenuation curves that have been uh, uh, worked on by many investigators over the past 20 some years. And so I'll give a little bit of a review of what an attenuation curve is and how they're derived and what progress has been made over the past 20 some years. So, oops, of course, oh, okay, there it is. Okay, so the first, uh, uh, the first slide is actually an introductory slide for those who don't uh, work on dust uh, and dust attenuation in a systematic way. What I'm showing on this plot, which comes from an annual review of uh, Charlie Conroy in from 2013, is a spectral energy distribution. And I hope you can see my cursor. Uh, if not, let me know yes. because... Okay, thank you. So the blue line is a stellar population. It doesn't matter what kind of stellar population, but you can see it has uh, ionizing photons below the uh, Lyman break, and then it has a UV emission, and then the classical features uh, of a stellar population, and that's in the absence of dust. The moment you add the dust, something dramatically changes in the shape of the stellar, of the stellar population, the spectral energy distribution of the stellar population, and of course you see that uh, the infrared starts to become bright. So in the presence of dust, what you have is a general dimming of the stellar population and a selective dimming in the sense that UV gets more uh, dimmed than the uh, optical in the IR, and the energy that has been taken away by dust from UV and optical is emitted in the infrared in a non-exclusive way, in the sense that it's usually hard to connect uh, whatever region has been attenuating the, in, uh, at the shorter wavelength to a specific region in the long wavelength. So there is a lot of mi mixing. But the general, uh, 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 the general effect is that there is general altering of uh, the luminosity, the shapes sometimes, and also the colors of galaxies because of the presence of dust. And in particular, if you can imagine this, the blue line to be the integrated light from a galaxy, you will contend not only with dim and attenuation, but also as this picture to the bottom left shows the patchiness of the dust coverage in these galaxies. So you are also dealing with a dramatic geometric effect. If you don't have time to hang around, uh, the next slide is actually the summary 
of uh, what I'm going to communicate. And in particular, something that has uh, emerged in uh, the last 10 to 15 years is that the effects of dust, because of the patchiness and the fact that not, you never deal, when you're dealing with galaxies, you never deal with dust that is a screen in front of the interstellar population, you have a, a patchiness that mingle, intermingles with the star formation history of the galaxy. In particular, you might have regions that have more or less dust, and where the general spectral energy distribution that you obtain is a mix of what kind of history the stellar population has had together with the amount of dust it contains. And the two ingredients, dust attenuation and star formation histories, are highly degenerate. So one of the biggest complications is try to separate the two, and in particular, uh, trying to constrain the two independently so that you can actually learn something about uh, the physical properties of the object you're studying. In particular, in this case, I'll be talking about galaxies. Uh, if you have infrared emission, so what I call in a MIR, FIR, which means mid infrared, far infrared, which is in for all practical purposes, uh, the energy emitted by dust in the, at these wavelengths, uh, you get some handle on how much energy has been lost in the UV optical and has been emitted in the uh, infrared. If you are dealing with a very simple stellar population, that's all the information you need. The problem is that when you're dealing with galaxies that have evolved for a few giga years, you actually continue to have a lot of degeneracies. And so large regions, more than one kiloparsec and whole galaxies, continue to, to show significant degeneracies. And this problem will be magnified at the times of the Euclid, the Roman Space Telescope, and JWST, when uh, we will be collecting a lot of data on high redshift galaxies, a resplen UV optical, and sometimes near IR, but very little in the far IR, uh, which will have to come from ALMA. But ALMA has uh, an issue of uh, uh, coverage and sensitivity, which will not match for these large surveys. So, this will become a serious issue in the near future when those big missions launch or become operational. So a lot of effort is going on, ongoing in the community to try to find diagnostics that allow us to separate the effects of dust attenuation from the effects of star formation history. Why I'm talking about attenuation, not extinction, so I'll be making a strong uh, separation between extinction and attenuation. Extinction is the one we're all familiar with, is a single point source and dust in between the point source and your server, right? That's an extinction. But when you're dealing with a complex population that occupies a, a non-negligible, uh, sometimes a non-negligible angular uh, arc of length, <laughs> there you're talking about attenuation because uh, the, the, the screen of dust may not be homogeneous in front of the entire population, or the dust may even be intermingled with the stellar population, creating patchiness in the optical depth. So whenever you are dealing with patchiness, uh, extended, extended the geometrical uh, uh, distributions and patchiness, potential patchiness, I will be referring to that as attenuation and not extinction. <clears throat> so why having a... a a, the degeneracy between age and dust, or star formation history in dust is a concern. Because uh, uh, under many circumstances, and in particular, if you don't have a high, a, a high resolution spe spectrograph, but you're dealing with uh, either broad or medium band photometry, oftentimes uh, a young but dust reddened stellar population looks awfully like an old dust-free stellar population, which is shown in these insets here, where, where you compare the, the red line, which is dust, young, young and dusty, with the black line, which is old with no dust. And although there is a big difference in the uh, 4,000 Armstrong bump, which oftentimes is not that obvious if you deal, say, with broadband photometry, the two look very, very similar. And if you're dealing with multiple populations in which some might be dusted than others, this becomes a wash. And even the presence of dust emission, it becomes harder to separate. So that's where the issue comes from in dealing with old versus young and dusty. 
what are the impacts that we can expect? There are impacts at, at different levels, not just for galaxy evolution, but as you will see, that we, there are also impacts for cosmology. I'll have a slide about that in a minute. But let's look first at the potential impact on that of dust on interpreting galaxy evolution. This is a well-known effect. What we are aiming for is the plot to the right hand side, where you have the co-moving volume, uh, the, the star formation rate per co-moving volume as a function either of redshift to the bottom or look back time at the, at the top. And this is from a, an annual review of Madao uh, Dickinson from 2014, which shows a nice combined set of data points. This is what we are aiming for, but what we observe is actually the one to the left, the two plots on the left. If you uh, point at your galaxies with a UV detector, well, UV rest frame detector, you, you look, uh, you see the blue uh, line, the blue band. Well, if you're pointing at your galaxies with an infrared, rest frame infrared detector, what you observe is the orangish or reddish uh, band. And the two are extremely, uh, quite widely different, as extremely well known by now. What they're telling you is that the most of the star formation rate emerges in the uh, IR, uh, at least up to redshift two or three, and only beyond redshift two or three, the two, the two contributions come together and possibly, although it's still fairly uncertain, uh, the UV takes over over the, uh, <coughs> the uh, IR. Of course, a redshift, uh, uh, in, close to the, I, I mean, age almost zero, when the first uh, stars were formed, we can expect the dust to be zero, but we don't have actually a good handle on the time scale for dust formation. Therefore, we don't really know how these uncertainty bands will sort out in the future. But what uh, these uh, two plots are telling us is that if we ignore dust or underestimate its contribution, we might uh, be mistaken in our estimates of the star formation rate per moving volume by a factor between two and 10, depending on the redshift and the conditions of the observations, and slightly less, of, uh, like slightly less of an impact, but up to a factor three in stellar mass estimates. So that is a huge impact on our view of uh, galaxy evolution if we ignore uh, these effects. And of course, the major effect of uh, uh, dust is not so much uh, in depressing generally the data points that we are observing, but is increasing the uncertainties in the data points that we report. And let's see if I can make this to move. Oh, there it is. <coughs> so if you have large error bars, like in this uh, uh, plot published by Suresh collaborators in 2015, and the light gray are the observations and they have fairly significant error bars. And you can immediately see so this plot covers from redshift nine to redshift two, is at the, the redshift is at the top. Again, this is the formation rate uh, per commuting density. And uh, you can immediately tell the multiple models can uh, go through the data for the simple fact that the error bars are sufficiently large that uh, you cannot discriminate between them. So clearly having small error bars and therefore nailing down the contribution of dust to these measurements is going to be fundamental for future constraining of the dominant models that drive galaxy evolution. Beyond galaxy evolution, as I mentioned, we have also potential impact on cosmology. Those who work on Euclid or the Roman Space Telescope know that their main goals are constraining the dark energy and the dark matter. And their uh, tools for uh, achieving this is to use uh, both a weak gravitational lensing, which I call it WL here for short, or the baryonic acoustic oscillation method, the BAO. Both rely on getting accurate distances for the galaxies. And both will use, for the most part, for 90% of their samples, will use photometric redshifts, which means that an underestimate of the dust, or an overestimate for that matter, of the dust may actually affect the photometric redshifts that will be derived. This will be the, the much worse for uh, in the redshift range between one and three, as we said earlier, well, one and four, as we said earlier, the effect of dust uh, is maximized uh, in that redshift range, but even lower and higher redshift will uh, be affected. Of course, uh, uh, both uh, uh, Euclid and uh, 
the Roman Space Telescope are, are aiming for the redshift range around three, two to three. Uh, so that's actually the peak of where the, the impact will be at the worst. <clears throat> and uh, last but not least, uh, let's not forget the reionization. One of the, uh, the problem with the reionization is that we'll never be able to observe it directly, right? Uh, we will never be able to observe directly the leakage of ionizing photo from galaxies at actually six or nine. The reason is because the intergalactic medium becomes opaque beyond redshift, uh, redshift three to four, depending on whose author you read. But still, that means that the reionization will always be detected in an indirect uh, fashion, which means that uh, we are collecting diagnostics, like for instance, the Lyman alpha extent and the Lyman alpha intensity to actually predict uh, what kind of leakage we'll have. That also means that we need to understand exactly how leakage occurs and what uh, and under what conditions it can actually happen. And for instance, uh, what uh, type of dust, uh, con uh, sorry, gas uh, physical conditions uh, favor it. Clearly you need a higher ionization low metallicity galaxy seems to be the most favored for leakage. But uh, although observationally you know which objects are most likely, we still don't know why. And uh, <laughs> the reason is because uh, first of all, you need to have leakage to occur extremely early when many of the stars are still embedded in their natal cloud of dust, uh, they need to be young and highly ionizing. And uh, of course, uh, this means that uh, your uh, natal cloud have to have a lot of holes. So geometry becomes key. And understanding the geometry of the sources become key to actually understand the leakage. And therefore, to understand, for predicting uh, uh, sources, uh, the sources that uh, drive ionization at high redshift. Geometry is key, not just for ionization, but in general for understanding uh, dust attenuation in galaxies. And in particular, uh, in this uh, uh, toy diagram, I, I'm showing two identical distributions of dust and gas, except that the relative location is different. At the top, they are on top of each other. So the uh, dust is mixed with the stars. And at the bottom, the, the dust is completely in front of the stars. So what that does the observer uh, see? Well, if you, this is actually shown in, in these two panels to the right. The input spectrum is the same for both. Okay, so the, the, spectra, the spectral energy distribution of the star population is the same. And the screen of dust, the thickness of the screen of dust, and of course, the characteristic of the dust are the same for both. As, as, shown by this, the color excess is B, B minus V. Yet the output is dramatically different depending on where the dust is. So the output in, in the case of the homogeneous mixture is a lot less dimmed and reddened than in the case of the foreground dust. The reason is pretty easy to understand because in the case of the homogeneous mixture, you have the thinnest top layer of stars is is almost unaffected by dust. So they will contribute most of your UV emission. The, most, the, far, the ones farthest to the, to the most buried, of course, will not contribute to the, to the uh, UV emission, but those uh, are not going to be the majority of stars. While at the, in the bottom case, all of the stars are behind the same screen of dust. So none of them is emerging in the UV or emerging as a strong depression of their UV emission. So geometry is dust not just for the case of ionization, but in general for understanding how uh, dust and stellar population intermingle together and what kind of uh, degeneracies uh, you can have. Now, that uh, is uh, the, these were the uh, terror uh, uh, slides to show you what kind of problems we can have if we neglect dust. What can we do about it? So the next few slides uh, are going to be a little more positive in the sense that they're going to uh, show you what uh, can be done about understanding and parameterizing dust and maybe hoping to remove it from the objects that we want to observe and for which we want to derive physical parameters. So one interesting aspect when increasing the amount of dust that affects the stellar population is that, of course, as we saw, we've already seen in, uh, under multiple fashions so far, the UV becomes redder and redder. And in particular, the UV spectrum goes from being blue to being red, depending on how much dust you put in. So the, what I call the UV slope is going, is going monotonically 
from blue to red as you increase the amount of dust, at least in first approximation, right? We see that there are many complications to that. And of course, as you increase the amount of dust, you decrease globally the amount of UV emission you have and increase the amount of IR emission you have. So technically speaking, your infrared to UV ratio, luminosity ratio is telling you how much total dust you're having. So if you plot these two quantities, the IR over UV observed versus the blueness, how blue your UV slope is or how red, you get uh, for certain type of galaxies, which are called starbursts. These are actually very mild starbursts. These are local galaxies that tend to have a luminosity of a few times, less than a few times 10 to the 11. So these are not leaves and ulips. These are central starbursts in the center, in the center of uh, normal star forming galaxies. This tend to actually, these galaxies tend to fall a fairly narrow sequence uh, in this plane, which is marked uh, for along the vertical axis by the infrared to UV and along the horizontal axis by the uh, how blue or red, so from blue to the left hand side to red for the UV, uh, UV spectrum. These uh, type of plots, similar plots, were used to derive a so-called atten starburst attenuation curve, which is in blue. On, uh, so on the uh, right hand side plot, I'm so showing the starburst attenuation curve compare with uh, a normal extinction curves like the small Magellanic cloud the, uh, in red, the large Magellanic cloud in uh, magenta and the Milky Way in cyan. So they might be hard to read, but practically the bottom line is that the starburst curve seems to be shallower than most of these other curves. However, because it marks a nice uh, a plane in, uh, sorry, a nice uh, uh, trend in the plane of IRX, uh, versus beta can be used to remove, uh, technically at least, uh, remove uh, effects of dust attenuation from uh, galaxies. And the principle uh, it works on is illustrated in these uh, uh, three plots. So you have, uh, uh, if you uh, place your attention to the top left plot, uh, and in particular the blue lines, so the blue dashed line and the blue continuous line below it, you uh, take your stellar population. So this is an unreddened stellar population, dust-free stellar population. You apply this attenuation curve to that uh, population and you recover the blue line that you can barely see uh, below it. Whatever is, is now missing, which is marked with a light red uh, band, has been thrown by dust into the mid and far IR. So that's uh, so is exactly how it would work for a, a star affected by extinction uh, behind a, a dust screen. It's just now I call it attenuation because uh, it's about a stellar population rather than a single star. And one of the problems of uh, having uh, something that uh, works uh, for one set of galaxies is that it might not work for other types of galaxies. And indeed, almost as soon as the attenuation curve was published, uh, deviations were observed. And in particular, um, the earliest deviations were observed for so-called normal star forming galaxies. So what's the difference between a starburst galaxy and a normal star forming galaxy? So the uh, normal star forming galaxies is typically a, a galaxy that shows a popcorn structure in their star formation. In particular, something like M51, which is shown here in this little uh, inset here, shows a star formation distributed across its entire disk. While starbursts, even the ones that are kind of puny and fake, like the ones that were analyzed by Eurere collaborators and Calcetio collaborators, tend to be centrally concentrated and have star formation rate densities, per, per, sorry, star formation rate surface density, so per unit surface area per kiloparsec square, a, about 100 to 1,000 times higher than a standard disk of a normal spiral galaxy. So this is more or less the dichotomy. It's not quite a dichotomy, it's a continuum, but uh, starburst galaxies are the high end of this continuum while the normal disks uh, practically uh, cover the entire continuum all the way to the lowest uh, values. And uh, this uh, normal galaxy seems to be, be covering a much wider, so there is, a, I, I've taken three pictures, one from Oberzier et al. 2011, one from Salim et al. 2019, I'll talk about this a little, uh, for a few extra minutes, and then one from uh, one of my older papers. But if you concentrate your attention to the top left uh, plot, you can see that uh, uh, for each 
value, say, of the IRX, say, around two, you have a large range, uh, sorry, for a, a given value of IRX, you have a large range of beta values. Uh, look at the horizontal uh, trend of uh, beta values. Of course, uh, uh, for an attenuation curve to work, you need to have a sort of one-to-one -one relation, at least a very narrow scatter. Well, here the scatter is uh, almost an order of magnitude in beta, which is practically the entire uh, range of beta values you can expect in a, in a, to be able to measure. And uh, the other plots are similar. So let's concentrate on the right-hand side plot uh, proposed by Samir Salim uh, collaborators that uh, maybe this uh, uh, scatter is actually simply a symptom that uh, this attenuation curve has different slopes as uh, you go from uh, more quiescent galaxies all the way to Starburst galaxy and actually become steeper and steeper, sorry, shallower and shallower and shallower. It becomes uh, steep just to uh, orient you if I go from eta equal 1.6 to eta equal 0 0.4, eh, it looks steeper in the IRX beta diagram, but the attenuation curve is shallower. So it's a little bit counterintuitive, but that's exactly what it means. <clears throat> so, okay. So it means that the issue, according to these authors, is entirely in the uh, dust attenuation characteristics and not so much in the characteristics of the stellar populations in the galaxies. Now, that scheme, that uh, hypothesis, however, seems to have uh, run against some of the recent, more recent findings for, from some other authors. I'm comparing here two plots from Battisti and collaborators. One, a comparison of various attenuation curves derived by many authors, a ratio roughly zero, and one, the same authors have derived their own attenuation curve, a ratio between one and three, and compare with other attenuation curves in the literature. And you can see, even by comparing the z equals zero and z equals three, but even taking the same z and comparing them among each other, you already see that there is a huge variety, much broader than what you would expect from simply looking at variations in the slope. There is a large variation in the slope, but there seems to be even more variety than that. And indeed, more careful analysis of well curated samples seems to indicate that there are multiple dimension, dimensions of uh, uh, dependency, not only on uh, the steepness of the attenuation curve, but also star formation rate density, and ages of the stellar population, metallicity, but also star formation history more in general, just simply beyond ages. The next plot shows uh, a very clear, uh, the very clear impact uh, the metallicity of the galaxy has uh, on uh, uh, the star formation, the IRX beta, beta diagram. So the steepness of the attenuation curve. So um, and this is a, a recent work by Irene Chivey and collaborators where they sh show the uh, redshift two. So they isolate a nice uh, well curated sample, a redshift around two. These are uh, metal-rich star-forming galaxies, but even if they're relatively metal-rich, they, they start from roughly the metallicity of the LMC and go up. They still see a clear trend for more, uh, more metal-rich galaxies. And you can look at the plot to the top, the top uh, left for more metal-rich galaxies to go progressively to a steep, shallower, sorry, shallower attenuation curves. So steeper IRX beta uh, trends, which implies shallower attenuation curves. And uh, it's a pretty clear uh, function of metallicity. Cor metallicity and mass are correlated. So a trend in metallicity is reflected by a trend on, in mass. And there is a, they don't find much of a trend either in age, or in the average age of the cellar population on the specific star formation rate. So clearly there is a role for metallicity for more metal-rich galaxies uh, to have a shallower attenuation curves, which is not too surprising because uh, if you look at their plot, this top left plot, the uh, continuous black line is actually the small Magellanic cloud extinction curve. Uh, and the small Magellanic cloud is a low metallicity uh, galaxy. So maybe that makes uh, some sense, but <coughs> maybe also uh, star formation history has a role. I'm showing three plots here. Um, this, uh, again, an old paper of mine showing uh, some models. Uh, here, uh, the authors, Casey et al, collaborators, actually simply 
fit the Rx beta towards zero and, and find a characteristic that I will explain in a minute. And then the one to the bottom left is a plot based entirely on simulations, which however drive, drive home the point that is made on the plot by Casey et al. So what is interesting about the plot by Casey et al? What they did, they looked at a, num a large sample of galaxies below redshift 0.09, 0.085, and they showed their measurements for IRX beta, all these plots are IRX beta. And what they did, they actually average out different beans, different uh, IRX beta values, and drew a line uh, along the, uh, the, uh, uh, all the beans, the average beans. And what they found out is that the slope didn't seem too different from the canonical IRX beta slope. But what they discovered was that their galaxies ended up at in a beta at zero, by zero IRX, so beta of about a minus 1.7, if I'm reading correctly. <laughs> what does it mean? OK. First of all, what does it mean that it's going to zero? It means that it's going to, it's a IRX equals zero means that you have no dust emission, no dust emission, which means you have zero dust, which means your stellar population is the original stellar population is zero dust. What is a young star forming population looks like on this plot? Well, on this plot, a young star forming population has a beta value above, so more negative than minus two. Is around minus 2.2 to minus 2.5, depending on metallicity, uh, star formation history, and so on and so forth. So the fact that they found that actually their galaxies trended to minus 1.7 was in itself notable, meaning that maybe we're not dealing with a young, uniform, uh, star forming stellar populations. We are dealing with something a lot more complex. OK, so this is a nice, interesting suggestion, but that doesn't mean that we have found the reason, right? The correlation does, doesn't prove causation. How do we prove it? There is one way in which we can try to do it, which is, OK, let's go inside a galaxy and try to uh, divide it in small, tiny regions and try to model each tiny region, which we can approximate or assume that is a simple stellar population. And then let's sum up all these models. So practically, let's slice and dice a galaxy or a region within a galaxy, and let's try to reconstruct it from the bottom up. So um, my collaborator and I chose this uh, one galaxy, 3351Y, where first of all, we had the longest uh, wavelength co coverage uh, that was uh, available nowadays. And so that was made for a convenient uh, uh, target, but it also has an interesting property. The galaxy in itself is relatively quiescent, the fact, the fact, despite the fact that there seems to be quite a bit of UV emission, the, uh, the central one kiloparsec region in, uh, surrounded by the red circle is about a thousand times more active than the rest of the disk on average. So that means that maybe, the, I mean, we can assume that the most of the star formation, which is also true, is concentrated in, in the central region, the central one kiloparsec. This central one kiloparsec also has one characteristic. If you look at the main sequence of star formation, it, it is located above it. Uh, depending on whose, uh, um, on whose uh, uh, main sequence you choose, uh, is either a few times or between uh, like a factor, a factor two to a factor seven above the main sequence. But in all cases, because different authors have different scatters, it's a uh, two to three sigma above it. So it's not one of the most powerful starbursts, but certainly still qualifies as one. OK, so it's a starburst. So maybe what we should do is to follow the starburst curve that we have been discussing so far. Lo and behold, if you uh, plot the central region on an IRX uh, beta diagram, the, the galaxy itself is already off the track. But OK, the entire galaxy is a sort of star forming galaxy. So maybe it's not such a, such a surprise. But the starburst center itself is actually completely off, even more than the galaxy is. So the starburst center actually seems to be falling, uh, following more of a small Magellanic cl uh, cloud type of uh, a uh, IRX beta correlation than being a little higher and actually obeying the starburst one, as you would expect if you have, are dealing with, uh, with a starburst. 
So what's the deal here? Is this a starburst? Or is it, we're simply misclassifying it. Okay, so let's look at uh, <clears throat> how this, uh, uh, this spectral energy distribution that we can reconstruct from the far UV around 1500 ohms with uh, a Galax uh, all the way to the near IR using HST observations, uh, including passion alpha and H alpha. These lines uh, are critical for a, a correct modeling. And so let's uh, uh, reconstruct this spectral energy distribution using a, a starburst, a young stellar population with a starburst attenuation curve or a, a similarly young st stellar population with an SMC curve and see what we end up having. So um, as we can, we can already expect, the starburst curve ex uh, predicts a much higher, much more luminous uh, intrinsic stellar population, which is understandable because the difference between uh, the intrinsic stellar population and the red stellar population creates the infrared emission. And the infrared emission, we already know that uh, if you follow the Starbucks curve, the uh, NGC 3351 should be much higher, right? So if uh, uh, this SB center follows a, a Starbucks curve, it should be somewhere here. Okay, so that's why the Starbucks is so much higher, while the SMC predicts a much lower, a much less luminous intrinsic population. Good. Then let's look at how the two red and star population fit the data. And you can immediately see that the starburst curve creates, uh, produces a much better fit of the UV optical and near IR data than the SMC curve. In particular, in one case, in the uh, case of the starburst curve, the chi square is 1.2. And in the case of the SMC curve, the chi square, the reduced chi square is greater than nine. So it's not an acceptable fit. So in practice, you are dealing with a problem, which is on one hand, your infrared to UV ratio seems to behave as if the important attenuation curve were an SMC-like style extinction curve. On the other hand, your SED, your UV optical SED wants a starburst curve. So how do we break this impasse? As I mentioned earlier, one option to break the impasse is to slice and dice your your uh, the central region of this galaxy where most of the star formation is located, and model each individual region individ uh, by itself, and see if uh, by doing the model individually and then uh, reconstructing the both the attenuation SEDs and the unattenuated SEDs, you can get out of this impasse. So this, uh, these uh, regions, so we have 10 regions in the center. These are the most prominent regions. And then we have a little bit of a background region that I, we also modeled. And these are the two plots here are two examples. One is region one, which is the big circle, one of the big circles here. And the other is region 10, which is at the, in the south. And these are the best fit models. And in, 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 in both cases, and in all 10, actually 11 cases, we can actually reconstruct a very good, very well the SED. Okay, so the next step is uh, let's sum them up and see what we get. So this is what uh, practically the process that we used. We divide the slice, uh, slice uh, the region in uh, as many sub-regions as we can. Uh, we can stomach to model. Uh, use a spectral, stellar population synthesis model and dust attenuation as ingredients for the models themselves and try to remodel all the individual regions. Then sum them up, okay? and both the attenuated and the unattenuated versions and see what we get. So below uh, on this, uh, the one called the figure 11, this is part of a paper, oops, sorry. Uh, this is part of a paper, that's why there, there are figure numbers. It uh, shows uh, the reconstructed attenuated uh, SED while uh, the, uh, the higher curve in this figure 11 shows the reconstructed dust-free SED by simply taking the models and summing them up. Of course, we have additional constraints. We want to make sure that the reconstructed the attenuated SED reproduces at least to a good degree what we observe. And the reconstructed intrinsic, once, subtracted, once we subtract the attenuated one, gives us something that is consistent with the emission in the infrared. The ratio between these two is the attenuation curve, as we have done, as many authors have done. 
What does this attenuation curve or net attenuation curve looks like once you compare it with the other existing ones? Okay, so first of all, uh, uh, what does it mean to have this uh, spectral energy distribution, right? So before we discuss the attenuation, I want to have one slide on the star formation history. Because this region here, this uh, reconstructed uh, spectral energy distribution is actually not just a simple uh, young population, it's a very complex uh, region where the star formation rate uh, has been first decreasing over time from about one giga year ago to about 350 million years ago and it stayed very low up to about 15 million years ago and then is now coming up again. This is a, a ring galaxy, a, a, sorry, a, a galaxy with a circumnuclear star forming ring. So this type of trend is not surprising, but it's, it's actually a key for understanding this uh, stellar uh, spectral, energy, uh, population, spectral energy distribution. This spectral energy distribution also has the characteristic that uh, it doesn't overshoot the infrared. It actually reproduces exactly the infrared emission that we observe. Okay, so the ratio of this uh, uh, spectral energy distribution, the intrinsic one to the redden one, gives us the attenuation curve. What does it look like? It's the gray, the black line with the gray band. This is what we derive. And on the left hand side is compared with uh, existing uh, uh, extinction curves, the SMC in red, the Milky Way in cyan. I also put the starburst attenuation curve for reference because it's the same in the two plots. And then on the right hand side is compared with other existing attenuation curves. So it tends to be a little steeper than the original starburst curve, but not as steep as some of the other attenuation curves that have been derived, and definitely not as steep as the SNC curve. So the question is, how do we reproduce uh, uh, the uh, shallow value in the IRX beta diagram of, the, of uh, 3351? The trick is the fact that the reconstructed uh, spectral energy distribution of the intrinsic population does not have the classical slope of, uh, a, of less than minus two that is typical of uh, a very young stellar population. It's actually as a slope of minus 1.9, uh, much shallower. Why, uh, uh, what, uh, why do we have this? If I go back a couple of slides and I go back to the star formation history, this is the key. The key is uh, these uh, earlier a episode of star formation older than 350 million years has created a lot of uh, a lot of stars that are still sufficiently bright in the near UV to give you a contribution in the near UV that is not reflected a similar contribution in the far UV. So you have that your most recent uh, reg regions of star formation are producing both UV and uh, far UV and near UV, but then the older burst is giving you an excess in the in the near UV making the, the, the intrinsic spectral energy distribution a lot shallower than it should be, normally if it were just a young population. So this characteristic allows you to actually pin down where the, your IRX beta relation should start from. And if you reconstruct it, it actually goes through the data point. So the, uh, the, the starburst center of NGC 3351 is not well modeled by a, a small Magellanic cloud extinction curve. It actually requires something that is not very dissimilar by, from a starburst curve, but simply starts, begins, is anchored to a much shallower or much redder stellar population because the intrinsic population itself is a lot redder. So that's what I mean by effect of star formation history. It's actually changing the, uh, the intrinsic SED of your stellar population, making it a lot redder than normally you would expect. So going to the conclusions, uh, I'm sorry, this has been a sort of tour de force in uh, as, uh, on details that probably most, most people are not particularly concerned with, but it, I think it's important to understand that the star formation histories have a huge impact on our interpretation of the attenuation in galaxies and therefore the reconstruction of their intrinsic properties. So these are quantifying the effects of dust and therefore uh, separating the effects of dust from those of star formation histories are going to be key for quantifying the evolution of galaxies and concerning the geometry of the dark universe. 
in the absence of extensive infrared surveys, rest frame infrared surveys, we will need to rely on methods that leverage the characteristics of the UV optical near our, our spectral energy distributions to try to reconstruct both the dust attenuation and the formation history. And this is, is going to be far more uh, growing importance as we move towards petabyte surveys, like the ones uh, uh, WFIRST or, um, or Euclid are likely to produce, not to mention uh, the Rubin telescope. The original uh, cheap method, as I call it, which is the IRX beta relation, has a huge scatter uh, for normal star forming galaxies. And, uh, and why do I call it a cheap method? Because if it were to work in a perfect way, by knowing how red or blue your UV spectrum is, you would have a one-to-one -one relation with understanding how much dust you have, right? You measure exactly how much dust you have. But because you have a huge scatter, you, you start to have problems. What is that scatter driven by? Well, it seems to have been driven a lot by the star formation history of your galaxy. And in particular, at least in this one case of this one galaxy, the offset is almost entirely due to the star formation history. <clears throat> Why is this important? Because many um, models that try to reconstruct uh, uh, the masses, the star formation rates, and other characteristics of galaxies using a spectral energy distribution fitting, even when they employ both from uh, anything from the UV to the far IR, they often implement uh, assumptions on the star formation history sense. Oftentimes, these assumptions are monotonic. They can be monotonically decreasing, monotonically increasing, but they tend to be monotonic for the most part. And so SED fitting codes uh, need to, will need to actually implement a more varied, more varied solutions, especially for the star formation histories, in order to reproduce and pin down exactly the amount of uh, dust that there is in galaxy, and therefore reconstruct the uh, properties, uh, intrinsic properties of the uh, objects they are observing. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, thanks. Uh, that was a great, great, great talk. Uh, at least as, as, a, as a user of, of these uh, dust attenuation laws and uh, dust radiative transfer codes, it clarified a lot of uh, concepts for me. So uh, thanks. Um, so, if, if anyone has a question, you can you can either raise your hand or uh, or write it down in, in the chat. Um, meanwhile, well, I, I do I do have uh, uh, some questions. Um, so, uh, so in, in in your first slides, one of your first slides, you uh, well, you mentioned that uh, dusty galaxies are most common uh, at redshifts of two or three because that's kind of like the sweet spot between gas content and uh, metallicity. Um, so I was wondering about the the, the, the the relationship between metallicity and dust content, uh, because, um, for example, is it is it a reasonable assumption uh, to assume that, say, the the, the dust mass is a constant fraction of the uh, metals mass or at, at 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 high redshift uh, uh, or. Um, or so, we say uh, yeah, it's it's actually an excellent question. Because I think that I think there is not a settled answer for that. Now, now one of the important concepts that I think are very very important to drive home is that it's not just the amount of dust that you have to worry, but how it's distributed, right? So, for instance, you might be familiar with the fact that a Lirg redshift two is completely different from a Lirg redshift zero, right? A Lirg redshift two has a lot of infrared emission, but most of its regions are not dust buried. While well, a Lirge redshift uh, uh, zero <coughs> has a strong infrared emission and a strong uh, uh, barring of sources in the dust. And it has to deal ex exclusively with how the dust is distributed, in particular in, in a Lirge or Ulirge, even worse. Uh, redshift zero has most of the dust and the star formation concentrated in the inner kiloparsec to 100 parsec, right? The Ulirges tend to be more concentrated. Uh, uh, a redshift uh, two to three, there are the, uh, the, the dust is distributed across the entire disk, so over multiple kiloparsecs. So even if you have a luminous galaxy, the dust emission tends to be cooler, almost as cold as a normal star forming galaxy in the local universe, and the amount, the number of the completely dust buried regions is much more limited. So geometry is not just the amount of dust that you have to worry, but how it's distributed inside the galaxy hmm. that uh, drives a lot of these uh, uh, effects. 
Okay, okay, interesting. Yeah, uh, thanks. Sorry, I have, I have, a, I have a, a scheme that around your question. The answer is that uh, is that to your question whether dust to metals is constant. I don't think it's settled. Some will say no, right? Because right. it really depends on the on the. Uh, on the on uh, how how you actually convert uh, a, a dust to metals, <clears throat> but uh, I I don't think it's settled actually. Right. I don't have a strong opinion in one direction or the other personally. Right, right. Okay, interesting. Okay, thanks. Um, so uh, uh, next is uh, <coughs> Javier. Javier, do you have a question? Yeah, um, maybe it's a dumb question. I don't know. <laughs> uh, in, in this uh, extension laws that you uh, show us, uh, well, there in most of them, uh, the, the ones that you derive, usually there is not this peak that we're used to uh, in the for the galactic extinction law, the typical extinction law in the near um, ultraviolet. Uh, so I was wondering whether it's just because they, you don't have enough uh, uh, metals or uh, some some sort of dust, mm -hmm. or if actually. It, it, because you know when you show this ngc 3351 galaxy I, I thought well this is more like like actually the milky way galaxy it's a spiral galaxy that looks normal so but but that galaxy also doesn't have the peak Do you use mm -hmm. peak? so is that a flaw of the model of the of the method or or you or actually that's the, the extinction law so that's an excellent question <clears throat> When uh, uh, I, I started to fit this uh, photometric data, so one, one uh, detail that is often uh, overlooked is that when you have, uh, say, the two galaxy bands, and you can only model the two galaxy bands, you have a huge degeneracy. You can have uh, no 2200 Armstrong bump, that I think that's the feature you're referring to, and uh, a, a shallow UV slope, or fit the same data with a steep slope and a strong bump. So generally, in order to break that, you need additional data. So I used actually a spectroscopy, UV spectroscopy, which is a, this, uh, I didn't talk about that because it's a detail, but practically if you look at the cyan line here is a, a UV spectrum of the same region uh, done with IUE. So this is, a, this is old spectroscopy. There is no hint of a bump, okay? And so that's what I used to make a choice and not to try to fit a 20 Armstrong bump. But if you only have two bands, the two UV bands from a Galax, you have a complete degeneracy. Okay. And indeed, I, Samir once ran a blind test for a couple of galaxies for which I have spectra. And he actually found a strong bump, but then we looked at the spectra, the spectra had no bump. Okay. okay, because the uh, uh, galaxy uh, unfortunately doesn't allow you to break the degeneracy. So that's what we did. Now, what is the physical reason? Uh, the physical reason might be, so I don't think it's ever been explained convincingly, but uh, one of the possible physical reasons is processing of the bump carriers. Especially if the bump carriers are uh, pHs, the energy levels that you can find in a burst of star formation can be such that the bump carriers could possibly be processed and destroyed. Why do I state that? Uh, that might be uh, the correct interpretation here. Because uh, there is another author whose name I can never pronounce, but I can send you a, a separately an email with the reference. They actually modeled the entire galaxy and three, three, NGC 3351, right? So not just the central region, but the entire galaxy. And there they find a bump. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. And, and the reason is because this is a spiral, meta-rich spiral like the Milky Way. Mm -hmm. So pretty much uh, you can expect that to behave like the Milky Way. But as I said, the rest of the galaxy is very quiescent. Mm -hmm. So it's probably likely that the energy level, the UV energy level outside of the central region is low enough that the bump carriers don't get destroyed. So if you model the entire galaxy, you, you recover the bump, actually a fairly strong bump. In this burst region, you probably process those carriers and they're not there. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Uh, so next we have Diva Karen. Hi. Hi, Daniela. Hi, how are you? Yeah. Uh, yeah, good talk. So now that you have this, uh, this galaxy here, uh, my question was exactly on this. 
so you're pointing that uh, the, the star formation history affects somehow all the analysis that you have presented. Uh, and uh, now you have chosen here the circumnuclear regions which are known to have this, uh, uh, I mean, they have low equivalent widths uh, and they have this uh, uh, past star formation event. So are you telling that uh, these uh, other high redshift galaxies where you find such problems also have this kind of uh, uh, Ill, uh, or prolonged uh, duration of star formation? Uh, no, I'm not making that statement. The, the, the situation could be different. What I just want to make uh, uh, raise awareness about is the fact that uh, <coughs> making a simple assumptions on the star formation history might lead us uh, off track. So if I so if I were to look at this galaxy, uh, so NGC 3351, I apologize for going back and forth, right? <coughs> if I were to look at these galaxies, so imagine that this is a high redshift galaxy. Right, and all you have is this data point here. You would be tempted to say that this is a young galaxy with an SMC style uh, extinction curve, right? In reality, is uh, as a, 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 an attenuation curve that is more resembling, uh, more resemblant of the attenu starburst attenuation curve. It's just that the star formation history is such that uh, this uh, this region has an intrinsic, intrinsic SED that would fall here. So away from uh, the pinching point down here at the, where this plot starts. And if you drive the, the starburst curve from here up, you would meet at this point. So what I'm trying to raise awareness is that we should be careful when making assumptions because uh, oftentimes uh, there are very simplified assumptions about the star formation history that are made for, uh, for galaxies, which may not be correct. And, uh, and I actually don't have a magic bullet for now for what would be the right answer to address this uh, high redshift. But I've seen some of the feats. So uh, some of the feats that have been published uh, or some of these high redshift galaxies, you look at the IRX beta diagram and it looks like uh, the center of uh, uh, NGC 3351. Then you look at, at their SEDs and uh, <coughs> the, SMC, uh, the SMC curve doesn't go through the, point, through the points at all. So there must be something more than just simply an SMC curve with a young population. Okay. I think this is an object that I shift for that I'm referring to, which I saw recently in the literature, relatively recently in the literature. Okay, uh, just to add to that, the, in, in metallicity wise, uh, I think this being circumnuclear is uh, higher metallicity compared to this kind of galaxies, right? Yes, yeah, so, definitely. So that is not the issue here. I mean, you're I no, I, I, we we actually were looking for something that was uh, meta-rich because the starburst curve has been derived for meta-rich systems. So we wanted to eliminate the metallicity as a potential additional parameter. So okay. in, in my case was, okay, if I use another galaxy that definitely falls off the starburst curve, but is as meta-rich as the starburst that were used to derive this starburst curve, do I get a different answer? And the answer is okay. the answer is yes, but not by much. Okay, okay thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Thanks for your question. Okay, so we, we also have a question from Roberto Terlevich. Hi Daniela. Hey. Thank you for your talk. Very nice. I, I agree with you that uh, even the most extreme starbursts, even the low metallicity ones, are complex systems. They are not really well matched by a, a, a single stellar population. They are more complex than that. And um, but in, in relation with the, you made the point and, and the separation between the the, the 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 screen type of extinction and the embedded dust type of extinction. And I was wondering about the in the embedded mode. Uh, what do you think is the role of dust scattering in blowing the light? The, uh, that's actually mode. an excellent point in the sense that the cartoon I showed as well contains also dust scattering. So a, a simplified model for a scattering of light into the line of sight. But yes, that's part of the game. <laughs> you need to worry about scattering into the line of sight once you start to have extended uh, populations. So my, the models that I usually implement uh, contain dust scattering uh, into the line of sight uh, uh, embedded in the code. 
for the embedded mode. Yeah. Yes, uh -huh. it's not so much uh, if the dust uh, is uh, uh, in front of the entire population and uh, far from it. Of course, uh, if it starts to be a uh, close, uh, it depends uh, <coughs> uh, where you serve, what you serve, and where you served. But yes, scattering mm -hmm. is a bluing is a bluing effect. Correct, I agree. Right, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so uh, I see that. Uh... Javier, you still have your, your hand raised. Do you have another question? Oh, I'm sorry, no. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, uh, in that case, um, if there are no more questions, let's thank uh, Daniela again. Uh, thank, you. thank you. Thank for you for having me. Thank you. Cheers. Okay. So see you Bye next everyone. week. Bye. Bye. Bye.